When the pH is 7, then it's a case where the sample is neither acids nor base. But less than 7, it's an acid, we say. More than 7, it's a base all the way. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about how non-metals produce acidic oxides and described the situations under which these act as acids. Well, in this video, I'll cover next to our point, which says analyze the position of non-metals in the periodic table and outline the relationship between positions of elements in the periodic table and the acidity basicity of oxides. So there's two parts. You have to analyze the position of non-metals and then also outline the relationship between position and how, how they act as acids or bases. So first of all, I'll go over quickly the, the actual periodic table again and what that's all about. So in the periodic table, we have a couple of things. We've got our yellow ones. The yellow ones are meant to be our metals. We have our non-metals, which are the ones in red. So we've got hydrogen here. We've got quite a few more on the right-hand side, all of these here. And we have our green ones, which are meant to be our noble gases. And then in between, so the ones that have a bit of yellow and a bit of red, these here, are our semi-metals. that act a bit like metals and a bit like non-metals. And this is important because we're going to go over that, obviously. We need to go over the periodic table for this dot point. And generally, remember that it has it's the octate rule. All of the actual elements want to have eight electrons in their outer shell. And the way they can do that is by either giving away or taking electrons. And they're arranged according to that. So, for example, the metals tend to want to give electrons to become, to lose its outer shell and have eight electrons. Whereas the non-metals tend to want to gain electrons, these want to gain electrons to be able to get eight electrons in the outer shell. And noble gases tend not to react because they already have eight electrons. So noble gases already have their octate full of electrons. And same metals, because they're in between, they can either give or take. So they're kind of confused. Sometimes they give, sometimes they take. And I'll go over this now in terms of the dot point itself. How I relate that back to how, what makes something acidic and what makes something basic. So we said, for example, that the non-metals, sorry, the metals, the metals are likely to give electrons. And the reason why is because metals have between one and usually three electrons in the outer shell. And it's going to be easier for them to give electrons to get to eight than to take electrons. If they have to take electrons, if you have one, so for example, if lithium wants to take electrons, it has one electron in its outer shell, it has to take seven electrons to get to eight. Whereas if it gives away one, it drops its shell and ends at eight. So it's going to give as opposed to take. So metals are like to give electrons. And remember what makes something a basic oxide? So for example, here we have that same example as last time. We've got barium oxide, which is our metal oxide. And here, this actual barium will lose electrons. Here it's lost electrons. And it's given these electrons to water molecule. And then this water molecule goes from water into hydroxide by grabbing this electron. You can see it's negative, so it's grabbed the electrons. And this hydroxide makes things basic, so it increases pH. Now here we've just established that some of our metals likes to give electrons, which makes things basic. And that's why metal ions or metal oxides are basic in nature. So it says, outline the relationship between positions of elements in the periodic table and the acidic basic nature of oxides. So okay, here we've got our metals. And most of our metals in this area, which are our, most of our oxides in this area, which are metals, make basic oxides. Basic oxides. But it's not just important to know that metals make basic oxides, but also the general trends. So we have trends that go across the group. So across the group, or sorry, across the period, so that way, or down the group. We have to talk about both those trends as well. Now, if we go across the actual period, so if, for example, we compare lithium, which is here, or let's compare sodium, which is here, to aluminium, which is here. Which one of those makes the more basic oxide? Well, sodium wants to give away one electron, so it really wants to give away electrons, whereas aluminium has to give away three electrons. So we said the one that's more likely to give away electrons 
is a stronger basic oxide. And sodium wants to give away electrons more because it's so eager. It's only gives away one electron and it's going to be so close to being having its eight electrons. Whereas aluminium has to give away five elect uh, three electrons. It's more unlikely to happen. So if it goes across, so yeah, I wrote metallic property decreases across the period, which is why basic oxides also decrease across the group. So we said the blue ones here were basic oxides, and you can see the MO3, I'm sorry, but it's a hard one to say, amphoteric oxides are the ones which are both gain and lose electrons, the confused ones. And we can see that's aluminium as an example, because aluminium has to give or take three electrons. So it has to either give elect three electrons or take five electrons. And sodium only has to give away one electron. So sodium is a more of a giver than aluminium. So the metallic properties decrease across the period, which means the basic oxide likelihood also decreases across the period. Now when it comes to down the group, it actually chances of the metallic property increasing down the group has increased. So for example, if we compare sodium, or let's compare magnesium, let's say this here is magnesium, and we compare that to barium. Here, barium, because it's further away from the nucleus, these electrons, these are electrons here, and obviously the white lines are just the shells. It has much more shells because it has its bigger ion, a bigger element, and its nucleus is going to be quite far away from the actual center, whereas magnesium is a smaller one. Its nucleus is quite close to the electron. And remember, when it comes to H2O, so when water is in contact, water will grab those electrons. And which one is going to be more likely to grab the electrons? Well, it's going to have an easier time to grab the electrons off here because it's further away from the nucleus. The nucleus is like a magnet. It pulls it close to it, but because it's so far away, the attraction is less, so it can easily grab the electron off the barium compared to a smaller magnesium. So this is more likely to happen, this here, whereas this, the other version, the water-grabbing electrons off the magnesium, is less likely to happen. It still happens, but less likely. So the actual properties, the metallic properties, increase down the group, which means that, for example, magnesium, which is here, makes less strong basic oxides than barium, which is here. So we said two things. If it goes across the period, basic oxides are less because sodium, for example, wants to give away one electron. It's going to be very eager to give away that one electron, whereas aluminium has to give away three electrons and would be less likely to give away three. And so that's if it goes across the period, if it goes down the group, the metallic properties increase down the group and it'll be more likely for barium to make a good basic oxide than magnesium. And the reason why is because water would be more likely to grab the electron of the bigger barium atom than it is of a smaller magnesium atom. And that was for metals. Now we're going to talk about nonmetals. So nonmetals are the ones which are electronegative in nature. Electronegative means that it's likely to, to take electrons. An example we gave was sulfur dioxide reacting with water. This is one example of last time. And that forms sulfuric acid. So now it's the sulfur has grabbed the electrons. It's all one big compound, and that will dissociate into hydrogen ions and hydrogen sulfate. And these hydrogen ions are obviously that makes it acidic. But the last example, the lost electrons, whereas here it's gained electrons. Now, which ones are the ones that are more likely to gain electrons? I said electronegative property increases across the period. So here, the so for example, if we compare against sodium, sodium is less likely to want electrons, to take electrons, than chlorine, because chlorine only needs to want to take one to become have eight in its outer shell, whereas sodium we have to take seven, which is very unlikely. So here is another example. So here we have that one electron, which is for example, this would be sodium, Na for sodium. This would be chlorine. Chlorine has to grab this would actually be fluorine. So we're comparing fluorine, which is here, to lithium, which is there. This here is lithium. Now lithium has to give away one electron or take seven electrons. It's much more likely to give away one than they take seven. Whereas fluorine would have to either take one or give away seven. It's much more likely to take one. And electronegativity talks about how likely it's going to be to take. So fluorine is much more electronegative than lithium. It's much more likely to take electrons. 
And anything that likes to take electrons makes strong covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. And all non-metals produce these covalent bonds. So fluorine is more likely to produce strong covalent bonds and thereby makes acidic compounds. Acidic oxides. Anything that makes a strong covalent bond makes acidic compounds, acidic oxides. And here this would be an example of that. So here we have H2SO3. This is a covalent bond between these. So down to so the electronegative property decreases, increases across the period. So we have, that means that fluorine is more electronegative than lithium. And electronegative, electronegative property decreases down the group. So if we go this way, so for example, fluorine is more electronegative than iodine because it's down the group. And the reason why is because if it's smaller, it's so wanting to grab that one electron, it has more of an incentive to grab one more electron. And if it's bigger, you can imagine a bigger one to be just a bit more satisfied, whereas the smaller one is so eager to grab an electron. So fluorine would be more electronegative than iodine, and thereby it would make, so fluorine makes more acidic oxides. Now I'm also going to quickly talk about the amphoteric oxides. These are the ones which are a bit confused. So they tend to be in the middle, and they tend to be the semi-metals, so these ones here, or the weaker metals. So zinc is not the same metal as a weaker metal, but aluminium, germanium, garium, all of these in the middle are your amphoteric oxides because they can either give or take electrons, and they're usually semi-metals. Now we also have some which are either, so usually for example carbon dioxide, here, this one, is a non-metal and it makes a acidic oxide. But if we have carbon monoxide, so we see here it says neutral oxides can occur, that's at N above its actual element, and we've got for carbon and for nitrogen, they can be neutral as well. And one example of that would be actual carbon monoxide, which is one here. And this is actually neutral, so this here is not acidic, it's neutral. And the reason why is because if you were to look at the actual oxidation number here, each of these oxygen is minus 2, so overall is minus 4. And for a, an actual compound, we have to have the actual oxidation number being equal to 0. So if we know that this is minus 4, then carbon has to have a plus 4. Whereas here, we know oxygen is minus 2. It has to be equal, so carbon is plus 2 equal to zero. And we said that covalent bond, the stronger the covalent bond, the more stronger the acidic properties. And because this is a plus four and minus four, it's so far apart that the plus and minus, so the attraction, the sharing between those two elements is very strong. So these make a stronger covalent bond than does this. So the higher the oxidation number for carbon in this case, the higher the actual acidic properties. So here it's got plus two, here's got plus four. So plus four makes it acidic, because plus 2 is slow, is a small oxidation number, this here is actually neutral. And the same goes for nitrogen. Nitrogen oxide is actually neutral, whereas nitrogen dioxide is acidic. It has to do with the oxidation number. The higher the oxidation number, the more acidic it is. And these have two, so yeah, carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide, are both examples of neutral ones, whereas carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide are acidic. So for this dot point, you need to analyze the position of nonmetals. You obviously need to know where they are in terms of the actual group. So you've got our alkali and earth and alkali metals, group one and two, these here. We've got our transitional metals and our same metals. These are all where our metals are. And then we need to figure out which ones are the basic, which ones are the acidic oxides. We know the metals generally make basic oxides. We know the nonmetals generally make acidic oxides. We know that in between the ones that are a bit confused, are the amphoteric oxides. I'll talk about more of them in the future as well. But these can either give or take. They can either act as acids or as bases. And then we've got our neutral oxides, which are the examples of carbon monoxide and, car and nitrogen monoxide. And these do not form either acids or bases. But Thank you for watching.